And welcome back to Let's Play Tyranny. Last time we left off, we had just finished suppressing the rebellion in the tears. We gained a new party member in the form of Eb here, who is formerly one of the rebels, but who swore loyalty yes. to us if we agreed to let her live, which we did. And we met up with essentially Tiberius's boss, Tunon, head of the court of the Fatebinders, who has informed us that there is a conspiracy of sorts going on at the moment, as at this moment in time, the Tears are in the midst of a civil war, so we've been tasked with gathering evidence against Graven Ash and the voices of Narat to determine and what kind of to determine who is responsible for this civil war the evidence we have thus far is all things that occurred during the conquest of the tears so the disfavor did attempt to bribe us to get iron weapons during the conquest and were ineffectual at getting Cairn, the Archon of Stone, to follow orders. I don't really know what to say about the whole Cairn thing, but we did give the disfavored iron weapons because Tiberius felt that the elite band would make better use of them than, well, the rabble. So there is that. The Scarlet Chorus also attempted to bribe us. In addition to that, we have interacted with the Spire at Vendrian's Well. And now we have to investigate the other Spires. So the next one we're looking for is at Lethian's Crossing. And Graven Ash wanted us to meet with him at Iron Hearth. So we will proceed with that and hopefully find some evidence. But I'm going to speak with our fellow fate binders first and see if there isn't anything they can tell us that would be of use. You gained favor with Tunan. Fate binder Nunval. Ah, Tiberius. You return unscathed and more claimed than ever, as seems to be your way. The fate binder of war claps you good nature with excessive strength on the back. Come, you must regale me with all that your journey has held. I could use a moment of respite between friends. He regards you with a warm, boisterous smile. <laughs> Speak as you wish. I'd pay a boar's weight in rings to know your thoughts. He rakes a hand through his thick red beard and offers you a grin. Come, let us speak freely. Well, I've... let's see. I have claimed the spire at Vendrian's Well. So, the court's whispers are true. The fate binder rubs his fingers along the underside of his chin, pondering his thoughts with great weight. Someday I would like to witness for myself the tower that has risen above the realms like a blade thrust into the sky. But that's all well and good. But can you tell me more about Kairos' armies, our quote unquote allies? Since I have to investigate them, I would like to hear your thoughts. Ah yes, with friends like these, our work is often self-explanatory. Are you asking about the Scarlet Chorus or the Disfavored? Let's start with the Scarlet Chorus. 
Harlot Chorus soldiers, and I use the term soldiers extremely loosely myself, hail from every corner of every realm. As the chorus marches, it conscripts indiscriminately, and those it has conquered to replenish its ranks. There's no continuity of command in the chorus. Narada Laos encourages even the strong to challenge their leaders. The chorus has numbers and brute force is almost always a viable solution, much as Rogalus insists otherwise. Besides, the chorus draws strength on the multitudes it swallows. Its blood chanters have taken knowledge from the various tiers mystics, and many of the chorus's best soldiers were grown here in the south. Then, tell me of the disfavored. The disfavored are the iron tip of Kairos's great phalanx, armed with the best weapons, the most comprehensive training, and led by the brilliant Graven Ash. The disfavored have no equals in open battle. The Legion has a saying, Graven Ash protects, and it's no empty boast. The Archon of War is able to lend his will and strength to his soldiers and give them endurance beyond human limits. I have great dis respect for the disfavored, but I know where I stand with them. They are a very close-knit band, all of them from northern families. Many of them relate to each other. Noonval sighs, his smile wistful. But considering our role in the great hierarchy, I can't fault General Ash for being selective. Yes, and as I've said in the past, Tiberius is much more willing to see the disfavored side of things than the chorus side, as the disfavored are an elite band of warriors and the best of the best, whereas, at least to our eyes, the Scarlet Chorus are just rabble. But let me ask you about something else. Well, you've garnered my attention. Hmm. I'm curious about Tunan's masks. It's not a topic I've had much opportunity to explore. They can be rather unsettling, can't they? Even to one such as me, but I can assure you, the innocent need not fear their objective, emotionless gaze. What are the adjudicator's masks specifically, would you like to know? I want to know about the silent face. The silent face is the face that Tunon shows to us now. And for the we are fortunate beyond for that we are fortunate beyond belief. The silent face is a patient face. And a face for listening as Tunon presides over all matters brought to the court, taking great pains to ensure all sides of an issue are heard. I want to know about the face of resolve. I mean, Silent Face just basically seems like his everyday face. The one he wears when there's not any particular need for a special type of feelings to show. Tunon's last known dawning of the Face of Resolve was the moment he judged and called ruin to half the districts in the Bastard City. Since then, he has ruled our northern tier justly, calmly, and with efficient diplomacy. Well, not really sure what to think about that, to be honest. It's an explanation, not really an explanation of what it is, more an explanation of what the last time he used it was. But, anyways, I'd like to know more about the face that is no more. Because that is a very strange name. <clears throat> Tuna is said to have worn a third mask in Eon's past. I have heard rumor that the face displeased Kairos and thus was destroyed, as happens to all persons and objects that displease our overlord. Yes, Kairos does seem to enjoy destroying things he doesn't like, doesn't he? But. Have you ever seen Tunon change his masks? In the way you or I would change our raiment? No, not as such. 
and yet I've seen the masks shift. They switch without the adjudicator or anyone so much as laying a hand on them. It's not something you can watch unfold. After a time, you merely realize it has already happened. There's work enough for the court that we shouldn't occupy ourselves wondering over mysteries. Something else, then. I find myself rather curious. How were you singled out to become a fate binder? I mean, I'm sure you know my history. Argue to not have my parents' heads lopped off when they turned out to do something that was a little traitorous and all that jazz. What about you? I cannot speak for the other fate binders, but I joined the court when I was yet a boy and impetuous beyond reason. I have been imprisoned with a death sentence for the crime of desecrating corpses. He laughs, hard and hearty. There's nothing so exciting as you're no doubt imagining. It was merely burning corpses that awaited burial. Before the local authority could see me to the gallows, the adjudicator claimed me a great talent waiting to be realized, needing only to be steered. Okay, why did you burn the bodies, though? That seems like a very strange thing to do. Corpses piling in the streets spread plague faster than the filthiest of rats. I was but ten and a weak fighter. I did what I could for my homeland. Well, if you were just trying to stop the spread of disease, I don't see why it was a crime. There was a time when even the Nor Northmen were of superstitious stock, a time before Kairos brought reason to the realms. People in my city believed that, without proper rights, I was cheating our fallen warriors from returning to the land. It's certainly a good thing Tunon spared you. <laughs> as I've said, the adjudicator saw within me something of rare value, as is true for all of us. Or, as is true for us all. You as well were chosen for our great court, for which I am grateful. As the fate binder of war, I rely heavily on your talents. <sighs> well... I'd like to hear about your past victories in war or recent events, if you would care to indulge me. Have you not yet tired of my tales, Tiberius? I do admit, I never tire of telling them. He laughs, hearty and deep. Very well. Let me champion the feats of my conquest. Let the glory of Kairos' reign fall on any ears that would hear of it. You may be interested to know that, as of late, I've entreated a forge-bound smith to craft me an iron sword, one he claims will not break in battle. However, and rather unfortunately, there appears to be an extended period of delay for the delivery of goods promised, even for a fate binder. Yes, how unfortunate. Well, it's been nice talking with you, new novel. But I'm afraid I must go. I have other individuals that I need to speak to. Nice talking to you, though. And we will talk with these other fate binders over here. So those three I'm not going to bother to speak with because they're the assholes who got us involved in this investigation in the first place. And they're with either the disfavored or the Scarlet Chorus, so clearly biased. Hello, Fatebinder Kaleo. Tiberius, I see you've returned to the fold. Your exploits in Vendrian's well are the matter of some discussion. The Fatebinder of Balance regards to you with a discerning eye, and for a moment, you feel as if she is trying to peer into the very depths of your mind. What can I do for you? Kaleo touches a gentle hand to your shoulder. How 
Let's see. Has anything happened while I was away? Anything of import, that is. The novel was dispatched to Stalwart to break the stalemate between the locals and the disfavored. He proclaimed Kairos' Edict of Storms, shattering the country with winds unending. Interesting. And that happened while we were away, proclaiming our own edict. Uh, how have you occupied your time in the bastard city? Tunan sends me on assignments here and there. I settle disputes with the locals when the adjudicator is otherwise occupied. She smirks. Everything from trade disagreements to pushing chorus squatters out of basements. Real rewarding work. <laughs> pushing squatters out of basements. <laughs> wow. I like her. I really do. She waves it off. The glory of war is not an honor reserved for the likes of us. We're the fish swimming in Tunan's wake, picking up scraps along the way. We're rather large and imposing compared to the bottom feeders of the tears, but fish all the same. Hmm. If possible, I'd like to know more about Tunon. I mean, I work for him, but somehow don't seem to know a lot about the man who I essentially owe my family's life to. Tunon is our overlord's fair and exacting adjudicator. He speaks with the voice of Kairos' law, and his word is judgment. All this and more you can learn by asking him yourself. Go on. Or does he intimidate you still? She chuckles softly. I jest, of course. Well, yes, he does intimidate me, actually. You might have noticed me not speaking much when he was addressing me up there. Uh, you seem to know a whole lot about what I've been doing in Kaleo. Have you been spying on me? Don't act so surprised. My duty to ensure that those who operate under the adjudicator's name adhere to the spirit of his law, if not the very letter. And those who don't? Will be dealt with swiftly and efficiently at the point of Blood and Mark's blade. A fate binder slips a slim dagger from the folds of her purple garb, flipping the weapon almost idly in the air. Of course, that is assuming I don't dispatch them first. I take my duty seriously, and I am very, very good at it. I've no doubt you are, and it's a good thing we don't have anything to hide, or we'd probably be dead by now with someone like her around. But I have some concerns about the war. You're free to share them in my confidence. She leans in closer. Let's see. I don't think we're too lenient. So either we can't win divided, or we Peace can't follow the kind of cruelty that's being shown. How would Tiberius feel? Well, as unfortunate as it is, I think he would feel right now that bloodshed and brutality are necessary to, um, to ensure that these rebels know their place. Our armies are squabbling and at each other's throats. We're divided and can't win like that. I'm less concerned about the armies than the Archons themselves. There can be no order when mountains collapse. Who would you see as champion? Well... We might favor using the we might favor the disfavored, if for no other reason than the fact that we have more of a connection to them because of shared heritage and Tiberius's belief in elitism. But looking at this. 
but he's going to force himself in this case to look at it from a neutral point of view. And from a neutral point of view, both armies are definitely at fault and both look equally inept because to use a saying that I used earlier on in this let's play, I think in the last recording session actually, it takes two to quarrel. And they're both at fault and equally inept in this matter. Her mood darkens. And then who would lead our advances or be left to deliver Kairos' peace? Would you wear this responsibility as a crown upon your head? You may find it a heavy burden to bear. Oh. No, no. You must understand my intent. Fate Binder studies you with a knowing eye. Do I? Yes, you do. I'd prefer the disfavored, but I think they're both at fault, is what I'm trying to say. Rogalus. Hello. Hey, Binder, you return. Rogalus looks you up and down with an inscrutable expression. You look as if you have questions for me to untangle. Ask. I'm feeling generous. Actually, no. I'm not going to ask about that. I got it. I don't think I want to speak to any of them, either. Or these blasted nobles. Into the maelstrom. We want to meet Graven Ash at Iron Hearth. That's going to be our next port of call. What is this now? Blade and Mark. Welcome back, kid. Amusing as it would be to watch the edict drop, I guess I'm glad you lived. Blade and Mark, Archon of Shadows, rouses from a faraway stare, turning to face you with a wry smile. And though he stands still, he seems to sift in and out of the shadows that shroud him. Hmm, let's see. Blade and Mark is Kairos' knife in the shadows, the unseen drop of poison that enforces the Overlord's will. And I accidentally closed that. So, uh, drop of poison that enforces the Overlord's will. He reports to Tunon the Adjudicator, serving in his capacity as the final word to those who hold Kairos' law in contempt. If you know the origin of the Archon of Shadows, or how Kairos maintains a hold on him. Those who anger the Archon never live long past sunset. Indeed. Here you threw your rings on Graven Ash's side. Not a bad bet to pick the Archon of War. But tell me the truth, did you go with Ash because it seemed like the right thing to do, or because supporting the voices was a worse option? Let's see. Ash is a better warlord, not about to hand control to the Archon of Secrets. What same creature would trust the voices of Narat? The last two are out. Let me see. Let's see here. What should I pick? Well, to be honest, looking at it from as objective a standpoint as we can, really, neither of them was at their best, and they were both at fault, but Grave and Ash was the more capable. The disfavored are nothing if not blindly devoted to their general, and though few in number, they are surprisingly difficult to kill. I don't have to like it to understand it. 
We both have our ways is for turning the tide of for turning the tides of war. All that matters is the edict of execution was stayed. A station at Vendrian's Wells should be thanking you for their lives. Now, I assume you're off to go meet with Ash, but first you and I need to have a little chat. Okay, I'm listening. What is it you have to say? Everyone's keeping an eye on you, because you did something nobody has done before. Got a guess as what that might be? Okay, let's see. Engage in war against an ally's soldiers. I don't think that would really gain much attention. As unexpected as it might be. Resolve an edict before the consequences came to pass. Possibly. Proclaim two edicts. Or awaken a spire of the old walls. Hmm, I'm going to say this because proclaiming edicts seems like it would be a rare thing in general. So I'm the first fate binder to proclaim two edicts. Is that it? Smart guess. <clears throat> there have been a few others over the centuries to have outlived the proclamation. Yeah, to have outlived the honor of proclamation twice. But sure, it's true that most don't survive it. Proclaiming an edict isn't new, neither is surviving or resolving the commandments of an edict. But you're the first to proclaim and resolve the very same edict, and it didn't kill you. Well, I was close, I suppose. But this ain't horseshoes or hand grenades. Close doesn't cut it. In one fell swoop, you survived your second edict, resolved the very one you had proclaimed, and woke an arcane structure that had slept for several centuries. And I suppose now I go on your short list of people who stand out as potential, so shall we say, problems. Is that what you're saying? More or less, mostly more. He offers you a dangerous grin. I don't care what you do with the information, but you should know the danger you're in now that you've put yourself on the map. Sticking with the disfavored is a smart idea, kid. At least smarter than getting mixed up with the Archon of Secrets. You'll never really be one of them, but if you value Ash's warriors, they'll serve you the best they can. Well, thanks for the advice. It's always helpful. The Archon of Shadows shrugs to you in farewell, but his golden eyes are alight with interest as he watches you. And we have gained the interest of Kairos' personal assassin. Why do I have a feeling this is not going to be good? Let's see, Sunset Spire. Mountain Spire at Lithian's Crossing. Where am I? Let's see. Iron Hearth is all the way down there. The Lithian's Crossing Spire is closer. I think I'm going to go there. Two days, 16 hours, and 30 minutes to arrive at the crossing. But since it's closer to where I want to go, and I think that is the more appropriate location to prioritize next. We have been ambushed by mercenaries of the Bronze Brotherhood. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> 